My name's Conrad Kunger. I'm a private GP in, uh, in Proserpine in, in North Queensland. And I've got the uh, privilege of being your facilitator for tonight's session. It, it should be a, a fantastic ride for us. Uh, like many of you, I'm in, in private practice and I uh, don't have the, the luxury of having esteemed experts uh, such as we've got joining us tonight around the, the door. So hoping that just like many of you, we can, we can get a lot out of tonight's session. Talking about how we can best work towards supporting the mental health of people living with obesity. I'm going to, uh, to just quickly run through the, uh, the, the members of the, the panel that we've got tonight. Hopefully you've all had a chance to peruse the uh, peruse information which was circulated previously. I'm going to start off with introducing Dr. Gary Killov. Gary is a, uh, a, a GP who's working in Launceston. He's uh, got a, a special interest in chronic disease management. And uh, Gary, I'm just wondering if you'd be able to, to just in, uh, give the, the audience a little bit of an idea about what actually does a, a special interest in, in metabolic health mean in daily practice? So as you mentioned, Conrad, the uh, interest is very much uh, centred on diabetes. And uh, many of our patients with diabetes, particularly type 2, uh, also struggle with weight. Um, so metabolic health is looking when one looks at the context of BMI, as, as, uh, and if we look at obesity as defined, or WHO definitions of BMI over 30, we're looking at the health of the individual rather than just how big they are. So we want to know how sick they are, which means that in addition to their um, phenotypical uh, presentation, we also know what their biochemistry looks like. We also know, want to know whether there are any comorbidities or significant risk factors. Wonderful. Thanks, Gary. Now going to move on to introduce uh, Glenn McIntosh. Glenn's a, a psychologist working in private practice in, in Queensland. Uh, Glenn, I, I wonder what was it about this, uh, about this area that, that brought you into this area of practice? Uh, Conrad, people ask me that all of the time and uh, because I'm very passionate about the area but the, the reality is that I kind of fell into it. I, um, I did a degree of sport and exercise psychology back before there were health psychology degrees and I actually was one of the weirdos who fell in love with the exercise side of things and the interest in exercise for the average person and then I had a great mentor who had actually transformed his life through the psychology of eating uh, and I just find the that, that weight management is such a, a complex and multifactorial challenge that it's 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 really meaty enough for me. But I feel like we can get really really good outcomes, and I feel like psychologists have a lot to add to it. So that's that's kind of how I fell into it. That's fantastic, Lynn. Next, my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Fiona Sutherland. Fiona is a, a dietitian in, in Victoria and a, a specialist in eating disorders. Fiona, what are the particular areas of satisfaction that you get out of your line of practice? Oh my gosh, where do I start, Conrad? Um, look, in all honesty, the, the the clients that I work with and the colleagues that I have are incredible. They're really inspiring, uh, and uh, you know th their ability to to overcome a myriad of challenges, whether that's a physical, psychological, um, and also cultural challenges of living in a world that is very complex when it comes to food and eating and our bodies. So I, I'm inspired by the people that I choose to surround myself with every day. So I'm very privileged. Wonderful. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Professor Philippa Hay, who's a psychiatrist in New South Wales. And uh, Professor Hay is the Foundation Chair of Mental Health at Western Sydney University. Professor Hay, I'm just wondering, what does our translational research into mental health sort of become as an as a area of practice? Well, I think it's about um, translating what we know from psychology labs and, and science into real world, world settings, into programs that um, we can take into our clinics and into our hospitals and into our practices um, that affect change, real change for people and that are um, feasible, practical, acceptable. Um, we can have the most fantastic randomised controlled trial but if it's only works for you know 10% of people with a problem or 1% of people with a problem and it doesn't work in the real world then it's not going to be that helpful. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, everybody. So what we're going to, uh, to, to move on to, just if anybody hasn't been familiar with the MHPN webinars previously, just a little bit of familiarity with the, uh, the, the webinar platform. So you'll notice that there's an open chat box uh, little tab in the 
bottom of the, the screen, which will then open up the chat box into a separate window. Uh, if you're wanting to contribute to the discussion, please feel free to, to put your, your comments in there. We'll try to get through them as, as we can. You'll also find there's a little resource library tab down the bottom of the screen. You'll be able to find any supporting resource, resources for tonight's presentation. And we've also got the technical support, uh, frequently asked questions tab down there, which you will find that can actually help you out with most of the areas you might be, be struggling with. But of course, if there's something there which we can't help you out with, we do have the, uh, the, the number there to call if you're ha having difficulty. And we'd also like to make sure that everybody uh, take the opportunity to provide feedback at the end of uh, tonight's webinar as well, which will be uh, available shortly at, at conclusion. Now we are just going to go briefly through the, the ground rules for, for these sessions. We just want to make sure that everybody's enjoying the, uh, enjoying the experience and gets the most out of it that we, that we can. Uh, so what that really means is just being respectful of the other pa participants and the panellists who we've, we've got on. So even though we're in a virtual space, remember that behaviours are you in, in the same room. And uh, please, we, we do encourage you all to, to participate using the, the, the chat box, but just please try to make sure you keep the comments that you're generating on topic because we are trying to peruse through nearly 500 participants worth of, uh, worth of input as we, as we go. So moving on to tonight's presentation, we're, uh, we're, we're not going to revisit the, the, the case study. hope you've all had a, a chance to, to visit Natalie's story. Um, but what we're hoping to achieve out of, out of tonight is being able to describe the general principles of a supportive environment for people with obesity who have poor mental health. Also wanting to make ourselves aware of uh, establish appropriate referral pathways to coordinate better services for people with obesity who have poor mental health. And also make sure that we are able to identify challenges, tips and strategies for a collaborative response that offers people with obesity who have poor mental health access to improved and better care. So after the, uh, after the, the, the delayed start that we had, we're going to, to move straight on to the, the, the story of Natalie that you're hopefully all well aware of. Natalie's our 32 year old woman who's uh, coming along to, to see her, to, to see the, a GP talking about the, the struggles that she's been having. Uh, as you'll be aware, she's had a long term uh, struggle with, with her weight and, and body image and some, um, some pretty disordered eating habits that have developed around that. So, uh, Gary, wondering as the, the GP who's uh, who's seeing Natalie for the for the first time, how would you move on to uh, helping her out? Yeah, so this is uh, the first consultation, which means that at this point I don't know anything about Natalie. Um, she's uh, she's an open book, so to speak. So the first thing that I need to do is once I invite her in and make sure that she's settled, is to keep quiet and let Natalie speak and uh, listen to her story and allow her to express what she considers to be the pressing and the most important aspects of the reason for her consultation. The likely thing is that she's been sitting in the waiting room for a little while. She's probably been rehearsing what she wants to say to me. She may well be a bit nervous and uh, and so for me, the most important skill to demonstrate at this stage is to respectfully listen, listen actively, and allow her uh, to, to uh, allow the story to unfold. Now, as she tells the story, and uh, which will be familiar to all of you by now, um, what will be apparent is that she has struggled with uh, uh, managing her weight. She's struggled with self-esteem. She's probably had some fairly unpleasant encounters, maybe within the uh, healthcare pro profession as well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that there has been an unspoken question. And that unspoken question would be about what my attitude, what my beliefs, what my approach to her would be. And so I think to get this out of the way, uh, I would actually talk about my views and make sure that she feels comfortable and secure and able to uh, express in more detail the sorts of things that she wants to talk about. She may well be a little guarded initially, but hopefully um, allowing her the space, particularly in a, in a secure way, uh, would allow her to expand 
on what she's talking about and what she's requesting. And as you know, she has come in requesting either pharmacotherapy or referral for surgery. And at, at this point, it's become quite clear that she, um, uh, she th th there's a whole lot going on. And certainly, um, I would be uncomfortable with simply writing out a prescription or referral for bariatric surgery. And so it's important that at this point we make sure that our agendas align so that she feels she's being listened to, that she doesn't feel she's being fobbed off, but on the other hand, that she has a clear understanding why it would be inappropriate for me to write out that referral or that prescription uh, until we know each other better, until we've explored a whole lot of other options. So where we move on from here is, of course, to end on a good note. Make sure that the consultation leaves Natalie with hope, uh, making her feel that she is on a trajectory that is positive for her. And what I would do is I would walk with her to the uh, reception desk and I would make sure that we reschedule the next meeting so that she feels that rather than this consultation ending, that it's really a, a transition to the next one. And I think at this point, um, you know, a lot would depend on uh, what she's happy to do. Uh, what I would be involving, uh, what I'd be looking to do is to involve individuals who I feel can help um, with what has now become apparent that whilst the ticket of entry has been her weight, um, if you look under the bonnet, we really see that there's some disordered eating, there may be some other issues that really need to be addressed uh, in a mental health setting, uh, in addition to, of course, addressing the physical concerns that she's presented with. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks so much, Gary. That's a, that's a yes, fantastic introduction into the area. And, and certainly no doubt at all about the importance of building a strong and supportive team who can be empathetic but also have the uh, the knowledge and, and the, the real command of the, of the area that we want to make sure we're putting the right people uh, because this is obviously going to be a very sensitive area and we want to make sure that we get this right. Glenn, there's no question at all that the involvement of a, of a, a good psychologist would add a, a lot to, to Natalie's care. I don't know if you'd be happy to add in your perspective here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, Gary started us off on the right foot, not only from the medical, but also from the psychological perspective, because uh, the first thing that we would look to, to do is first to do no harm. And I think it's really important that we all consider the, the impact of weight bias and, and stigma and discrimination. It does create a whole range of adverse outcomes from depression to relationship problems and actually makes people less likely to come back and see any of their health professionals um, and as Gary said Natalie might have experienced this from previous health professionals um, we do live in a world that kind of idealizes thinness and stigmatizes fatness so we could could almost assume that Natalie's experienced some of this at some stage um, I think it's really important for people to realize I know there is this kind of idea of giving someone tough love or the the truth that they need to hear but but often people do in, interpret those in a very stigmatizing way and that's actually quite harmful for weight management behaviors. It kind of pushes people into restrictive eating patterns that lead to disordered eating. It can result straight uh, directly in overeating and, and it stops people from exercising a lot, um, especially uh, exercising out in public. Uh, there's a really cool little uh, resource here, the Implicit Associations Test, which uses reaction times to measure your own implicit associations towards fatness and thinness. It's a great little resource that I'd recommend people have a look at just to, to, to explore your own weight bias. And that takes about probably 10 minutes to do, so a really good little resource. You know, I think it's it's important that you know Gary talked about the the type of uh, you know person that we present to to Natalie, and also I think it's really important that we consider the environment and how friendly that is for someone who's living in a bigger body. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to consider our space, the furniture, 
the staff that, that we, we put on and what they're wearing and their attitudes towards bigger people. And a really good thing to do uh, for people who are looking to work more in this space, and I suppose because people are getting uh, bigger and bigger these days, that it, it almost becomes all of us to an extent, is just to, to have a, an audit of, of your environment and see how, how fat friendly the environment is. Um, after doing this at our practice, and I've been sort of specialising in this space for over 10 years now, we made a few changes like getting a, a downstairs room for our clients, getting bigger furniture because, you know, a lot of the, the standard furniture is not necessarily very comfortable for people, um, and then just looking at the, the staff and our attitudes towards people. So I think that's the, the first point. We can also really, it's important for us to look at language and uh, of course Conrad spoke in this uh, person first language, didn't say obese, we're not working with obese people, we're looking to, to work with people who have obesity, so we're, we're, we're putting the person first. But I think we can probably do a little bit better than that because of course a lot of people do find the words obesity stigmatizing. So you might prefer to talk about a person who is above their most healthy weight. Um, then again, it may be worthwhile to, to sort of uh, talk in more weight neutral or weight inclusive language and just talk about the person themselves, you know, a person who's looking to, to get better control of their eating or a person who's looking to, to take better care of themselves. I think it's, it's also important that we look at what we don't know about Natalie, um, you know, uh, weight management and the psychology of eating and body image is very complex and very multifactorial. I think it's important that we look at her general psychological health and that's why it's so important to have someone like Philippa on the team. Uh, I think it's important that we look at those things like her metabolic health and that's why it's so important to have someone like Gary on the team and even just worthwhile checking her actual BMI because she sort of self-reported that it's 32 but a lot of people might under-report or miscalculate it and that might factor into how we treat Natalie. Uh, but all of that really underscores, like Conrad said, the, the importance of having an interdisciplinary team who are really on the same page about how we work with Natalie. Something that's very interesting to me as a psychologist is I think that we're probably going to be encouraging Natalie to set non-weight goals or aims, uh, but but they become a little bit um, a little bit abstract. And so I like to actually measure people's relationship with food, their self-esteem and body image, and we can use that as a bit of a baseline and check for improvements. Um, I use that using a questionnaire that you can be located actually on our website. So for the last probably eight or nine years I've been working with um, academics to get a, a battery of psychologically validated tests, so empirically validated tests, into a free resource. So that is something that, that you can use and your clients can use to measure how they're going and it pretty much measures everything that we'd be interested in for Natalie. If we start to look at, at what we might do with Natalie to support her, um, I think that the, we, we first look at the things that we wouldn't do and I wouldn't be too interested in supporting Natalie to do another weight loss or diet approach. They, they tend to be very ineffective at best and can often lead to eating disorders, especially if they're unsupported or rigid or extreme. Uh, so we wouldn't want to give her a, a treatment that's going to make her challenges worse. Um, I don't think that I'd be a fan of her doing bariatric surgery because she's just not in that BMI category of 35 to 40 with comorbidities or 40 and above without. And again, I wouldn't be, uh, be too interested in her doing a pharmacological intervention uh, for weight loss, maybe for her mood, uh, maybe for her, her binge eating, but definitely not for, for weight loss as there's no evidence that that would sort of result in a longer term change for her. Uh, potentially what we would do uh, to support her would to, to be to do some CBT work or some what we would call these days CBT plus incorporates a bit of uh, media literacy and a bit of uh, acceptance and commitment therapy or mindfulness principles and that has been shown to be efficacious in improving body image and eating without needing uh, the person to focus on their weight. Uh, we could also do a, a non-dieting or a, a, an intuitive eating or a health at every size approach that I know Fiona will talk to you a, a little bit more about that. Um, and a final interesting thing I really like to do with almost everybody who has um, challenges with their body image 
is just look through their social media. We know that Natalie's become a bit of a, an Instagrammer, and we do know that being repeatedly exposed to those thin ideal images does warp someone's sense of what's normal, not only cognitively, but perceptually, and that results in uh, uh, sort of detrimental effects to both their body image and their, their mood. So, so that's what I would sort of think for Natalie. And there's a few references there for, for people who are interested in looking a little bit further. Glenn, fantastic. Thank, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Glenn. That's a, a, a brilliant insight and some really um, some, some strong um, strong steps there, which we could all probably put into into place quite simply tomorrow, but also building on further if we're if we're looking in, into this area. Fiona, there's no doubt at all that uh, that Natalie's going to really need the, the support and, and the help of a of a, a uh, dietitian who understands this area and, and certainly isn't isn't out of her depth. Fiona, Thanks, what would you bring so to, to Natalie? Um, well, first of all, I just really wanted to start off just by acknowledging um, that I have body privilege. I, I live in a smaller body, and everything that I've learned about um, about eating disorders and living in larger bodies, really, I've learned from my clients. I've learned from my friends and colleagues who have first-hand experiences of that. So I just really wanted to pay tribute to that and acknowledge that as a as an educated um, cisgender white smaller bodied person I think you know there's a lot to be said for elevating the voices of the people that do live in larger bodies um, and that we can really learn a lot from them and I've certainly over 15 years or so have, have gathered uh, quite a lot of knowledge thanks to the people around me. Uh, so one of the first questions that I would be asking Natalie um, is a question that I ask most people who come through my door and that is uh, what was your relationship with food, eating and your body like growing up? Now this is a really interesting question because it sets up a really strong foundation for our assessment and also helps me uh, to understand Natalie's experience in her own words and invites her to tell a story um, which reflects you know honestly her, her own experiences um, it allows me to listen uninterrupted um, and to gather you know lots of rich information so in particular I'll be paying attention to timeline and to the way that Natalie talks about the way different experiences have influenced or affected uh, the way she has related to food eating and body um, and yes yeah, so I'll be really focusing on that particular question and weaving that through the whole of the initial assessment um, so in terms of specific questions that I'll be asking I'll be covering off uh, plenty of the uh, physical questions as well as psychological um, and uh, particularly when it comes to um, eating patterns for example I'll be asking about frequency frequency of eating and just getting a bit of a snapshot of her eating patterns particularly with regard not not necessarily go into great detail about content but more around food rules how much she's eating um, and when in the day just to get an idea really I'm looking for evidence of restriction um, restrictive beliefs um, and then how that restriction kind of um, turns into other kinds of behaviors in the day uh, I'll ask, also asking about things like menstruation um, if there has been any diagnosis of PCOS because that's something that's actually very very common amongst uh, women who have been diagnosed with binge eating disorder in larger bodies so that's something I'll be particularly asking about um, as well as any other diagnoses any other bowel issues any anything else that might inform the way that Natalie, Natalie is presenting to me. Um, from my perspective as a dietitian, I'm unlikely to weigh her. Um, that's not something I would typically do in a first consultation. However, I will be asking her a lot of questions about her weight history. Um, and in particular, what I'm going to be looking out for, I guess, is any particular escalation in weight or any dramatic drops in weight and the patterns of everything in between. So then moving on, um, I'm going to uh, be some sp spending some time reflecting together with um, Natalie on any major experiences or events that have um, that have really affected her experiences around food eating and her body with particular emphasis on things like um, her mother's um, her mother seems to have been very strongly influential in terms of eating behavior and then also um, her housemate which seen who seems to have been highly influential reality is that Natalie may have had very limited opportunities to have exposure to um, to people and experiences which give her an idea about what what quote-unquote normal eating might look like normal I prefer to call it natural eating myself 
um, and what it looks like to have positive and flexible relationship with your body. Um, I meet many, many people um, in exactly Natalie's situation who say, I think everybody's on a diet and everybody, um, no, I don't know anybody who likes their body. So Natalie could be one of those people and that's one of those questions that I'll be asking her. So with regards to, you know, do we focus on weight or not, uh, I personally think this is a very important but very tricky conversation. Um, it might be during the initial assessment that Natalie expresses a desire to lose weight <coughs> and, and why should we be surprised? We live in a culture where, uh, where apparently bodies are meant to be fixed and controlled, um, you know, whatever the cost and, and Natalie perhaps would be no exception to this and in fact um, she is presenting as somebody who, who may be in a great deal of distress about her body. Um, so I guess my experience over time tells me that you know enacting our weight loss behaviours as Glenn said is also not going to be very helpful for Natalie and so I would be um, very willing to have you know conversations with her around her distress around her body but be really aiming to um, to help her calm, calm down enough using um, some mind Mindfulness strategies and self-compassion strategies to um, to be able to uh, move forward and, and stabilise her eating behaviours. So from a practical perspective, um, as I said, I'd be aiming to really help her to stabilise her eating patterns um, and not only to help her to be better nourished, but then also to help her move forward into a space of body trust um, because in terms of her eating disorder recovery that's going to be building the strongest foundation we can with moving forward into a place where she can um, eat with confidence, where she can move her body with confidence and to be able to take care of herself long term. Uh, so I find that in practice, uh, people who um, are quite highly distressed about their binge eating behaviours but don't always see the restriction as terribly problematic. Um, so I find it really important to have the conversation around um, how those two behaviours um, can influence each other and kind of bounce back one, one to the other. Um, so I draw, as you can see on the screen here, what I draw is this um, this kind of um, this kind of thing. Maybe on a, I've got a little whiteboard in my room which I find really helpful um, and I use that to, um, to illustrate you know that, that restrictive eating can lead to binge eating and you know there is um, to help people kind of understand you know what, what um, and explore you know what does natural eating, what might natural eating look like for you. Um, so we focus first really on stabilising the restriction and addressing any food rules, um, also aiming to uh, reduce and contain the frequency of weighing and counting whether that's counting calories, steps, um, grams of food, um, all of these behaviours can be very insidious and um, and find their way right through people's um, behaviours. So depending on how chaotic Natalie's um, eating patterns are, I probably wouldn't um, write out a, like a meal plan as such, but rather than doing that I would help her, you know, maybe explore her eating patterns maybe with the assistance of maybe, um, a, maybe a monitoring kind of or appetite awareness um, journal. Um, you know, through a sense of, of gathering um, mindful awareness and Natalie can be more aware of the events, whether they are emotional experiences or thoughts or sensations in the body that lead to her um, engaging in restriction or engaging in eating disorder behaviours. Uh, so. Um, um, as you've as you've heard me say, you know the two factors I think that are most important with Natalie for me are um, self compassion, so that sense of being kind when things don't go the way we wish, and then uh, then um, developing mindfulness strategies too, because um, in developing insight and awareness, she'll be able to take better care of herself, no matter which direction she heads in. So moving forward, from the first consultation I'd really be aiming to get a team together for Natalie. Um, I would say probably 50% of the time client, I see people for the first time, they, have, they haven't come from another professional um, because often people who feel out of control with their eating think that maybe a dietitian can help them get their eating back, um, back in control and certainly if you, if you happen to stumble across a non-diet dietitian health at every size or an eating disorder dietitian then you've kind of hit the jackpot really. Um, and that's not necessarily going to be the case if you doctor Google people. So, um, and then the other 50% of the time I get referred from um, psychologists, psychiatrists, GP and other mental health experts. 
Um, so if I'm the first person, I'd be aiming to establish a, a really um, fantastic team for Natalie to help her um, to really feel confident moving forward in terms of her, her recovery from an eating disorder. And um, I, I tend to, um, I tend to uh, recommend like-minded people in terms of that um, weight-inclusive approach um, who are going to really support Natalie from an appropriate, an appropriate therapeutic perspective. Um, so, um, yeah, and if, if team members are already in place, then of course I would be asking Natalie with, um, for permission to contact them, of course. If Natalie's in Melbourne, there is an option for her. She has binge eating disorder, and so she would be a suitable candidate for um, our RIPE group, which is in Melbourne. Um, it's a 14-week uh, closed group therapy uh, program that we've been running uh, for 12 years, every Saturday morning in Hawthorne. So um, myself and Sarah Harry at Body Positive Australia, we um, you know, that's, that's specifically for women with binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa, so I would be, you know, I'm recommending that as, as just one option. Not everybody wants that option, it's, it's absolutely fine. So just to pull it all together, in summary, I'd be offering uh, Natalie a weight neutral approach um, or a weight inclusive approach, which prioritizes recovery from the eating disorder and addresses her body dissatisfaction and supports her to build knowledge, insight and awareness in terms of her eating behaviors. Um, so one thing that I saw today that I might thought so it might add a, just a little something tonight, uh, and you'll forgive me for just reading straight off my paper because I thought it um, just reminds me of all the Natalies in the world and many of whom I have the privilege to um, work yeah. alongside. So please forgive me indulging the next 30 seconds. So we blame ourselves for failure to fit into clothes and boxes and labels and personalities that are too small to contain who we are. We become afraid to take up space because we're afraid of what others might think and because we get really good at following the rules. The rules that make us feel safe and accepted. The rules that keep us trapped. So that's for all the Natalies in the world, many of whom cross my path. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Fiona. That's a, a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful set of, of, of great tips and really just some, some really practical, real in, insight there on, on you know, what this area of work involves day in, day out, and how we really can stay positive and, and keep engaging as well as we can. Philippa, there's no question at all that in the case of a patient such as Natalie, that there might actually be some significant mental illness which is underlying the, the situation that she's arisen in, in now. Philip, I'm just wondering, as a, a, a psychiatrist working in this area, what might be your uh, insights into to Natalie's case? Well, I think um, Fiona and Glenn have really covered a lot of the things that uh, we hope will be covered by other people working in the multidisciplinary team. So what the psychiatrist really brings is sort of looking at bits beyond that and looking at the other uh, problems that may be present as well. So all the things on the sort of left-hand side, um, Fiona and Glenn have really covered in terms of assessing the eating disorder and the diet and the weight history, which are also you know, so very important. But for the psychiatrist, you'd probably be looking also at is there a concomitant mood disorder? Is there an anxiety disorder? Social anxiety is a very common um, disorder for people with eating disorders. And as well, how is she in terms of herself and her interpersonal function and also the, the medical side of things because psychiatrists are also doctors would be also wanting to think about that and check that she's had a good GP and um, has had um, the appropriate investigations done. And then as Fiona was talking about taking a developmental narrative. So moving to the next slide. So with that, we would take it all together and review and discuss with Natalie how her eating disorder has developed and how it is in relationship to other problems that she might have in her life and to her physical and broader mental health problems. And like Fiona, I like to, on the next slide, I like to draw this out um, on a computer or on a whiteboard with the person to sort of get an understanding and, and it's very much patients very appreciative of this because you're giving them a sort of um, a picture of how their eating disorder has developed and they very often say yes that's exactly, um, it, it makes sense for them and then they can understand better themselves and there's less of that sense of blame or guilt or uh, for having a, a mental illness problem or having an eating disorder. 
And in Natalie's case, there is certainly, um, for example, we would talk about the culture that she's grown up in, the, the dieting culture, the broader culture um, that Glenn also talked about with weight and stigma related to obesity. <coughs> we know that in her narrative, there may be things that happened earlier in her life, and also this is all added into how she views herself, and we know that she has become um, a person who values herself in terms of her body weight and shape and body image, which then leads into the disordered eating behaviours, as Fiona had outlined, that then tend to perpetuate upon each other. And other eating behaviours which she hasn't had to date, such as vomiting or laxative abuse, we may talk about with some with bulimia nervosa. Natalie, we would say, has binge eating disorder at this stage, um, but she is engaged in probably a vicious cycle of dieting and binge eating, but that's set in a background of who she is, how she was feeling about herself as she grew up, and the culture and society that she comes from. And then we bring it together to see how we might be able to value add to the very excellent treatments that are available um, by people like Fiona and Glenn in the community. And going to the next slide. Um, we would explore with her what treatment she's had to date, what therapy she's had to date. Has she had specific therapies, evidence-based therapies such as cognitive behavior therapy? Has she had therapy specifically for that one might integrate that with um, problems with weight disorder or weight management? Has she had therapies that Fiona was talking about such as um, body uh, self-compassion type therapies, mindfulness, broader therapies that we know are also very helpful for people with eating disorders? Is there a role for her for medication? Is there a medication for any specific mood disorders that may be? Or even for binge eating disorder, if the binge eating is very, very frequent, we have some medications that we use. I put role of surgery very much in brackets at the bottom. It doesn't appear to be at all, in the, her case, um, at a role for thinking at all about surgery. But going back to the top of the slide as well, just thinking about where she is in terms of what she is looking for in therapy as well. And we should never forget that the vast majority of people who seek treatment or seek help for an eating disorder actually are presenting for weight loss. They come and they say, I've got a problem with my weight. And as Fiona said, often it's getting away from thinking about weight or even weighing people to thinking about the eating disorder and thinking about the associated psychological issues that are related to the eating disorder and helping the person with that rather than with any degree of weight loss at this stage. Um, but we know that they are presenting for help with weight loss, so where are they in terms of wanting treatment for the eating disorder, wanting to start addressing some of the eating disorder behaviours um, as opposed to wanting to seek further weight loss? So that's a very important aspect, I think, of assessment, particularly for people who are overweight, who have eating <coughs> disorders, and kind of directing them down, down a path of help for their eating disorder which for many, um, if that's addressed, then the, hopefully the issues around weight and shape and needing to lose weight will be much attenuated and become not a part of themselves and how they value themselves, which is the major goal for me when I'm trying to help someone with an eating disorder is moving away from that overvaluation, self-evaluation in terms of one's body image or weight or shape and valuing oneself for one's personal merits in other domains of one's life. And that's my last slide, I think. Okay. Thank you so very much, Philippa. That's, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it's such a depth, and it, often it's not really until you can, you can sort of step back and, and take that overall approach of not just focusing on what's happening right now, but what's the whole story been that, is, that has led us to, to this time that you can really sort of bring that, that, that perspective in and, and go with it. Well, we're going to move on to our question and answer session. I, I know that a lot of you have been struggling with the, the progression of the slides, but hopefully you'll be re still receiving the audio and, and rest assured that uh, from here on in, most of, most of the, the benefits you'll get will be, be following the audio, so there won't be much more in the way of, uh, of content that you're needing to, to go through. We've certainly had some um, some good sessions, some good questions which have come in during the uh, during the session this evening. We're going to try to catch up on on some of those. We've also got some of those which have been submitted prior to tonight's uh, discussions. Gary, I'm going to open with a, a question to to you, which has been circulating a bit. 
there seems to be a, a strong genetic component to, to obesity. How do we best assist parents to avoid multiple generations of obesity affecting one family? That's uh, that, that, that's a very good question, and uh, and and it really deserves a very long answer, which unfortunately we don't have the time for. But um, I think there's been a recognition that obesity is intergenerational for all sorts of reasons. Um, if we think of obesity as we would any other chronic progressive condition, uh, we can summarize it as genes loading the gun, environment pulling the trigger, and age determining the outcome. And if you think about the individual who may be on a trajectory to uh, gain excess of weight, um, some of those environmental influences actually begin uh, within the uterus. And those first few years, including the intrauterine environment and early years of feeding, uh, in fact, uh, would set up probably 80% of the long-term final trajectory of, of weight for that individual. So it may sound terribly depressing that uh, essentially what happened to you in your first four or five years of life is what you're going to be fighting against for, for the rest of it. But uh, understanding this means that, uh, as you said, Conrad, the, 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 the information, the education begins actually with the prospective parents before they even become parents. So ideally, if, for example, Natalie uh, were to meet somebody and want to start a family, then there would be many good reasons for her to lose weight. Now, I do appreciate that um, much of the discussion has been that uh, the weight is, is really the ticket of entry, is actually the presenting symptom rather than the problem. But in a situation where we would be talking specifically about reducing the risk of intergenerational um, obesity, then uh, weight loss in this particular instance would be appropriate. Uh, another example would be if she had diabetes, uh, weight loss would be very beneficial. Thankfully, Natalie doesn't have any of those issues, and so for her, really, the big ticket item is her eating disorder. So I think it's about working out what it is that we want to tackle, and then we tackle it with the appropriate tools. Thanks, Gary. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's brilliant, mate. Right? Philip, uh, Margaret and, and some other uh, participants have been, been asking about, you know, certainly for many patients with mental illness, their, their medications may actually be compounding their issues with, with weight gain. And especially when we're talking about medications like antipsychotics, especially clozapine, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are particular effective medications which are more favourable in this, in this profile than others? Yes, there are some more recent antipsychotics like loracidone which appear to be less um, associated with the weight gain and definitely in someone with um, a weight disorder or an eating disorder I would avoid um, medications like olanzapine um, because they are associated with significant weight gain. Um, often with my when I've worked with people, it's been working to find the antipsychotic that doesn't cause or the weight gain, and then people often lose quite a lot of weight when you find them on the, the right antipsychotic. So not just leaving them on the antipsychotic, but send them to a psychiatrist and um, find an antipsychotic that doesn't cause the, them to have severe weight gain, and they will lose the weight gain that they had on whatever it was. Particularly risperidone and olanzapine are very problematic in this regard. Um, and as well, um, being associated with metabolic syndrome, um, which you don't want people to have either. No question about it. Being able to, to restore some hope that, uh, that, that, that it's not all lost and that there are some better alternatives out there yeah. it would, would really be fantastic for all of us to be able to, to share. Glenn, an uh, interesting question about how do we challenge the sense of futility that people with uh, people living with obesity feel in, in taking on exercise or diets when it all seems too hard and that their self-esteem is already gone? What might be your approach there, mate? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, Conrad, because um, you know a lot of people have a really strong desire to lose weight at, at all sorts of uh, weights and shapes and sizes. Um, and... And, and they naturally have a, also a sense of this learned helplessness that while they're hoping that something's going to going to help, they're, they're, you know, there's a big part of them that's really lacking that self-efficacy. And it, it's a bit of a, an interesting answer because if we look at the the research on most weight loss approaches, so behavioural diet and exercise programs, which is the go-to for most people, 
they're actually very ineffective in the medium to long term. And the, the more uh, restrictive or unsupported ones uh, can actually lead people to eating disorders. So what we actually try and do often is actually encourage that sense of learned helplessness in the diet and exercise for weight loss paradigm in that approach and help people understand that it's it's not their fault that that hasn't worked because it is terribly ineffective for people in the medium to long term. But what that then does is open the door for new approaches. So uh, say if Natalie did have some sort of um, uh, you know metabolic health issues to actually go and treat those health issues directly or like we've discussed with Natalie, a, a weight neutral or weight inclusive non-dieting type of approach or if it is really medic medically indicated for someone, not in Natalie's case, but if it's medically indicated for someone of a very large BMI um, or a you know, BMI of above 40 or, or 35 and, and above with uh, comorbidities, then uh, look at, at exploring other options like some of the various bariatric surgeries, which um, with good support and the right uh, chosen candidate, can actually be quite effective at improving uh, mental health and physical health. Thanks, Clint. That's, that's great. Fiona, we've, we've spoken a, a quite a bit tonight about the, the stigma that it is, is associated with, uh, with living with, with obesity. Um, what are your tips for assisting people with, with obesity to overcome that self-stigmatisation that can sometimes become a feature of their presentation? Well, self-stigmatization is um, most commonly known as internalized weight stigma. So what, ha what happens is that is through life and now research is showing it's happening unfortunately from a very young from very young ages from about the age of three um, that we are internalizing ideas and ideals about bodies and um, and then and weight and then that extends of course to our food and exercise and, and eating and so forth. Um, but when it comes to internalised weight stigma, to be honest with you, I really think we need to start with, um, you know, amongst ourselves as health professionals, is taking a really good look at our own attitudes and our own beliefs around um, the bodies of the people that we work with and our fellow human beings. Because um, I think when when we're working with people in a variety of different body shapes and sizes, and particularly people who who live in larger bodies, I think just creating that compassionate awareness that um, that you know a lot of people do not enjoy the um the the comfort of being able to walk around in the world without um without kind of being noticed or without being criticized so i think um internalized weight stigma is one thing and i think you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh, really great things around self-compassion and, um, and some beautiful psychological approaches that can really um, encourage people to develop that sense of, of kindness towards themselves. But really, to, to be honest, I think the, you know, when we're looking at big picture, I think it really comes down to us as health professionals, you know, really leading the way and being incredible leaders when it comes to the way that we're um, approaching people, um, particularly in marginalised populations um, and people who are in larger bodies. That's wonderful, Joe. Thank you very much for, for that. We've uh, had some, some questions from the, uh, from the, 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 the audience about Sometimes one of the, the useful motivational tools which we're finding, particularly in the, the 21st century, is that there are some, some handy um, self, uh, self sort of help apps uh, around and, and resources that are available in that, that regard. Just wanted to get the, the panel's opinions on any useful apps that they, they've found or are there any particular resources or do we actually have any value to, to these at, at all? Um, Gary, have you had any experiences on this area? Yeah, so, so certainly apps around diabetes management uh, and also health and fitness, you know, particularly with the explosion of uh, fitness trackers, um, the, um, the literature is mixed and uh, it appears that the people who derive a benefit were those who are already engaged. In other words, somebody who's not engaged, if you give them an app or you give them a fitness tracker, they remain disengaged. So I think on their own as a tool, um, they, they have been a little disappointing. Um, the, the statistics around apps in general, not just around health, uh, are that the vast majority get opened once only. 
So, so I think like every other tool, it's got to be the appropriate tool for the individual. Um, and as I say, for those who are engaged, it can be very beneficial. But it's certainly not a panacea. Glenn, have you had much experience with, with the apps at all? Yeah, Conrad, I've um, I've had a look around and, and my opinion is that I'm not a, a big fan of, of calorie counting type apps and, and those type of sort of anything that's, you know, any tool can be potentially used as a, as a dieting tool. So anything that's, that's going to, to fire up a sense of restriction or a real focus on weight loss, I'm not too big a fan of. And then, uh, you know, we work more in this mindful eating, intuitive eating, um, size acceptance type space. And I have had a, a pretty good look around. I'm not sure if Fiona has anything, but uh, I haven't found anything that I that I really like in that that space at this stage. The only thing that I do, uh, you know, I, I think that it's always important that with all of our people, we zoom out from the number on the scales and focus on the whole person. So the only app that I, I find quite useful is um, the Headspace app. I like, um, you know, and general mindfulness apps, but unfortunately I haven't found anything that I, I really like in this space in terms of developing intuitive eating skills or, or body acceptance. Fiona, are there any freely available resources that you'd recommend or that you're a fan of? Uh, look, I'm with Glenn, to be honest. Um, I really love a lot of the mindfulness apps because I think that, you know, when we're developing those skills, we're able to notice our own experience and we're able to notice and track, um, you know, what's going on for us. So I think essentially with someone like Natalie in particular, that's a skill that I'd be looking to build from the ground up. But um, there is one called Am I Hungry, which is really a mindful eating app, um, which is probably the best of the bunch. But, you know, there's a bit of evidence around pen and paper and writing it down. Um, the the only thing with that is people um, people's privacy. They really prefer to, um, you know, make sure that it's there's a sense of guaranteed privacy. But um, I'm quite, to be honest, I'm a bit of a fan of pen and paper when it comes to um, any kind of journaling or, or tracking. Um, yeah, it just doesn't have that over-focused component on it that Glenn mentioned. Hmm. And Philip, I wonder, are there any... Uh online or, or digital tools that you recommend to your patients? Um, there is. Um, the Centre for Clinical Interventions in Western Australia has a lot of online information, which is very helpful of online resources, like one page on you and iron, for example, in terms of nutrition and also information, um, sort of psychoeducation type information for people with eating disorders. Um, I have used um, online apps in terms of with use of cognitive behaviour therapy. We ask people to monitor their thoughts, feelings, eating patterns, um, whether they've had episodes of binge eating, for example, where they were in the context. But I'm with um, Fiona, I think. I think most um, patients when they do it and they bring it along on their phone it's very hard to read and I think it may I think just something about writing it down on paper and bringing along the the, the compositions on, on paper and the, the narratives that go with that um, seems to be more more meaningful to people it seems to be something that they can much more easily sort of share in a therapy session um, than some, than the app that's on the um, on the phone or on an on an iPad for example so I don't use apps very much clinically but I certainly do use online information quite a lot and it's a very good way of um, yes, quickly okay. downloading and giving people A lot of comments also from our audience tonight about that we, we shouldn't make assumptions about exercise that, that people who are, are living with a, a larger body are unwilling or unable to, to exercise and we certainly should be uh, taking a, a, an honest history and, and asking that that is part of our, our area. Um, we also know that exercise has lots of positive benefits psychologically as well. Uh, Glenn, how, how would you recommend to, to your patients that they build exercise into their routines? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question, Conrad. And I think that the people who are messaging there are exactly right. There are plenty of... Uh, big unfit people and there are big fit people and there are small people who are unfit and there are small people who are fit as well so it's definitely not a a one-to-one -one correlation <laughs> and as, as always our plan is to zoom out and and consider the overall health benefits and, and i say to people if you're exercising to lose weight it's like going on holidays just so you can take the pictures 
you know, it's just such a very small, narrow uh, benefit that, that you're looking for there. And if we zoom out, uh, you know, as the you know the doctors will know that you know it, it's exercise is like a magic pill for your body, and and um, as the you know psychologists and psychiatrists will know, it's it's like a, a you know everything that we can measure gets better with exercise. I think it is also important and a good point that you mentioned there, Conrad, is is how we actually build the physical activity, um, because uh, with my background in sport and exercise psychology, I think a lot of people will try and build their exercise like an athlete would and, and, and do stuff that's probably too gung-ho for them. It's focused on weight loss or fitness or health. And in doing so, they create a, a pattern of exercise that they actually don't enjoy. And of course, then enjoyment is the biggest predictor of exercise adherence. So they don't stick with it and they don't get the benefits. So so we have an approach at weight management psychology and we, we have some personal trainers that we call... Um, size diverse or body positive PTs and, and that they actually prioritize the psychology around the relationship with food over the physical benefits. So do they enjoy it, reducing embarrassment, uh, problem solving any barriers from a place of empathy rather than just you know, suck it up or be disciplined and making sure that they have a sense of self-efficacy or confidence in what they're doing. And what we find is that people actually become, it takes a little bit more time, but they become a lot fitter um, uh, because they stick with their exercise over time and it becomes a, a want to rather than a have to that gets dropped off the list when, when the other more important priorities sort of take precedence. All right, that's, that's wonderful, Glenn, and, and certainly it, it's the the message to me that uh, regardless of, of whether talking about Natalie or for, for our other patients who might be living above their ideal weight, that we want to make sure that they're happy before we start talking about the, the weight as being the, the, the path forward. Gary, what other uh, would you have a, a take home message for the for the audience coming out of tonight, mate? Yeah, I, I think to a large extent I need to, uh, particularly with a case such as this, defer to my colleagues who, uh, who really have m far greater skills in terms of the, you know, dealing with the psychological aspect of what first and foremost is an eating disorder with a whole lot of other things attached to that. My role really is uh, as the GP is as the coordinator and making sure that the appropriate referrals are made, that the appropriate um, uh, interventions are coordinated uh, I think it's already been mentioned that we also need to make sure that, that uh, all other aspects such as metabolic health and uh, possible emerging uh, comorbidities or complications of being overweight are dealt with. Um, so once again, you know, certainly support and endorse the uh, team approach. And, uh, and, and, and this is a long journey. This is something that is not necessarily going to be linear. It's not necessarily going to be predictable. And we address issues as they present. We'll have some victories, we'll have some challenges, uh, but I think it's a matter of sticking with Natalie, making sure that she doesn't feel that she's been abandoned or that she has to do this alone. No question about it at all, Gary. That, that's the, the fundamental role of every general practitioner, that that's the, what we should be able to offer our, our patients, that through the, the tough times and the, uh, and the good, that we're going to be there with them and that we're going to see them through the, uh, the, the entire journey. Philippa, I'm wondering, would there be any uh, any take-home messages that you'd like to share with the audience this evening? Um, I'd really like to emphasise that we have good treatments, very good psychological treatments um, for people with binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa and other eating disorders. And, and when um, people... Um, are able to access those treatments and, and engage in them with a therapist whom they trust, um, then the outcomes are often very, very good. So we can be very optimistic. Um, I'd like to leave it with a very optimistic message about seeking those sort of treatments. And although, as I said, um, very often people are worried about their weight and seeking treatment for their weight, very often if they the eating disorder is addressed and they really are helped to be more active, feel happier in themselves as a person, often the, the weight problem becomes much easier. To Fiona, handle, I don't know if we can, if we can come any better with the, 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 the letter that you shared at the end of your, your presentation, but what would be the key message that you'd like the audience to take away from Yeah, tonight? I really loved what Philippa said about having an op, uh, you know, a sense of optimism. There are some wonderful therapists, particularly working in the eating disorder recovery space, 
who are taking this very weight inclusive and health at every size type of approach. So if anybody here had, you know, isn't, isn't, for, if, for anybody here who those words are new, then I um, really encourage you to get in touch with, you know, MHPN because, um, you know, information from tonight will be available on there and, um, and just to know that um, recovery from an eating disorder is absolutely certainly possible and that when we can see the real human being and when we can treat them with compassion and care and help them to develop resilience um, within a culture that is sometimes um, not very kind to um, people in larger bodies. I think that uh, the support that we can offer to these people um, can go a million miles and those people can then also um, be leaders in the community and um, and and really help help other people in their lives particularly if they're parents for example you know to really create that environment where their kids can grow up feeling good in their bodies regardless of, of what shape or size it is and I think that's the best um, you know that's kind of the best future we could hope for for the kids coming through thanks Joanna and Glenn, finally over, over to you. Uh, we've, we've covered so much area already, but what are, what are you really hoping the audience might be able to take away with tonight? We have covered so much, and I, it's been an absolute pleasure for me to be a part of this. And I think uh, if I could add anything, this, this webinar has just reinforced to me the real importance of working in an interdisciplinary team. I think uh, you know every member of this team has really worked in a more of a transdisciplinary way. We've all done a little bit of each other's jobs and then we've all got that specific part of our job that, that no one else does as well as we do. And I think that I say to people, you know, the psychology of eating, movement, weight, body image, it is definitely a team sport with, um, with I don't think everybody, and you might have heard it here, I don't think everybody has to be necessarily uh, on the same page all of the time, but we've got to be like-minded and in the, the same book. And I think that the last person that we, of course, add in here is Natalie and, and her as an expert on herself. And I think that if we take an attitude of, of collaboration uh, and an attitude of uh, focusing on Natalie as a whole person, then I always feel with the, 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 the group of health professionals working with a person like this, then we're going to find a really good answer. Thanks, Glenn. And look, I've got no doubt at all that if, if Natalie walked into to my room tomorrow, I certainly would feel as though I'm more able to, to recognise what might actually be those, those important underlying issues there, be able to, to develop a, a safe and supportive network for her, and most importantly for myself, to, to be able to, to assure her that we'll be here with her throughout the, the course of this progress because... Getting help is that always that, that toughest first part, asking for, for help and to know that there actually is hope in the, in the future that we're going to get there and things are going to get better from here on in. That's the best that we can, we can hope for. So thank you very much to everybody for your participation, to, to the, the, uh, the, the panellists for those wonderful insights and, and experiences that you've shared, to the participants for enduring with us through what I know has been challenging with the, the audio hassles and, and the, the delayed start, but also for the very insightful comments and experiences that you've been sharing through the, the, the chat rooms as well. Please make sure that you do complete the feedback survey before you log out of to tonight's session. And uh, that you'll see the tab at the, the bottom of the screen for that. We'll then also be able to forward out your certificates of, of attendance uh, shortly to the, to the email that you use to, to register for tonight's presentation. What you'll also get when you receive that certificate of attendance is the, uh, the, the link to the online resources that we've been speaking about tonight. And uh, you'll also be able to access the recording if any of you had the audio drop out along the, the way. Mental Health Professionals Network, well, our next webinar is going to be understanding the impact of veterans' mental health on their families. Uh, and that's going to be coming up in a few weeks' time on Thursday, the, the 5th of October, from quarter past 7 to 8.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Remember, we'll be chained over at that, that stage. So make sure you do log on to the MHPN site and, uh, and register for that at the, at the time. Um, and of course, yeah, we, we, we need to, to make sure that we, we do continue to grow the mental health professional network because this is such a valuable resource, not only just in the online space, but also for your local community. So if you are interested in actually forming one, have a, have a look at if there's one around or if you might be interested to get into it <coughs> yourselves. So before I close, we would just like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past, those who are continuing to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you, everybody, to your participation this evening. Good night.